kind of pressure are we talking about? What kind of opportunity, the best okay. opportunity? I'm telling you, when Swaram first started taking up these cases, there were very, very few voices that spoke in, on this issue. Why? Maybe they thought, oh, okay, it must be some gangsters or thugs. Very small, isolated number of lawyers right. that were coming forward. Right. But now, I'm, I'm, I'm actually encouraged that we actually are in a new, a new kind of Malaysia, a, a Malaysia that's more courageous, mm -hmm. and we're speaking in collective bold voices. And now you find that ordinary people are actually questioning why are people dying under police custody and the push and the momentum is so strong now that this is the moment that this is the time you would not have imagined Darmendran's uh, uh, police officers actually being charged a few years ago that the home minister would feel pressured and that the AG would feel this is the this is what needs to be done hmm. so by having more rallies more um the, the, the rallies are, are, are platforms for people to express themselves. Is that another form of pressure? It's, yeah. a, it's a form of pressure, that's it. It's Can you state down two or three things that Swarm is doing specifically to pressure the government to take action? Is it through the Bar Council, perhaps? Okay, you like know, in the case here. of Darmendran, we actually ran a fax campaign. Mm -hmm. We ran a fax campaign and we flooded his office with, with mm. a sample. I mean, we provided people with a very short two-paragraph sample uh, letters asking for Darmendran's, uh, uh, the of police officers involved to be charged. Mm. Now what we also do, like in the case of the ISA, is we try and organize the, the family members of the victims because they need to know what their rights are. They need to know what possible avenues they can, they can fight for. And then we try and bring legal assistance, legal aid, working with the Bar Council, mm -hmm. working with groups like Lawyers for Liberty and other, other organizations, because lawyers are very important in this sense. When you have an inquest, you need to have lawyers who actually do watching briefs. You need to make, make sure that uh, whatever that is, that is uh, spoken about in testimonies, whatever that is actually said is recorded and it's properly documented. Where do you see us going? I mean, with all this, okay, you say pressure, you say bar council, you say legal means, you say watch, you know, crime watch, and we also have, like, people protesting, for example, all this. Okay, uh, where do you see this going? Where do you, I mean, nothing has happened since 2000. Well, it, it actually, a lot worse has happened since 2000. We're really sliding down the slippery slope. And all these reforms, that have been promised by Najib, he needs to answer for it. And has he not answered for anything at all? He has not. He has not answered for many of the corruption scandals that have been exposed. He has not answered for this whole issue of so death how, and custody. How can this whole entire cabinet, under his leadership, sustain to the next general election? Well, that's a very good question because he's running a minority government. He's running a government that does not enjoy the popular support of the people. What can the opposition do in this case? Well, <laughs> that's a good question for them. But one of the things that has happened since 2008 in the, in the, in the post-12 uh, general elections where there was a, a tsunami of sorts and where the two-thirds majority was broken in parliament, mm -hmm. here is where we had a parliament that was coming to life. Mm -hmm. We had debates that mattered. We had bills that were argued until 4 a.m. in the morning, 3 a.m. in the morning, because there were enough people to actually voice uh, opposition mm -hmm. to bills that did not promote democracy, to bills that did not support human rights. Mm -hmm. So this two-third majority thing is completely gone. There's no more railroading through bills that actually don't work in the interest of the right yet. Mm -hmm. so, so do you foresee that in the next general election that the opposition will have the two thirds then or you feel that it will be a Dewey government moving forward? Or, or we don't have to wait for five years? Well, many people are actually talking about not waiting for five years. Uh, and I think what we uh, believers in democracy and believers in human rights would actually like to see a two-party system. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. In fact, it's the most healthy form of democracy because when you have a two-party system, then both sides will actually be formulating policies for the interests of the people, for the interests of the right. Yeah, may the better side win, you mm -hmm. know, and the more evil side 
cast away and then they'll come back in the next election with a more attractive agenda. Mm -hmm. And this is where it's a win-win situation for the people. A lot of people just don't know. I am someone online all the time and I've not heard of any of these things that you yeah. have mentioned or what the riot can do. Tell the riot yeah, what, what, what they can do. What specific things that they can do to support uh, human rights and as to believe to uh, a new government or a better government, whether it is the existing government with the right people in position or safer prisons. Safer prisons. What are some of the things that they can do to help this process move forward? Well, I think for one, the right yet are already moving in that direction. One, they're using social media mm. to the maximum because mm. we all know our mainstream media is so completely controlled. Mm -hmm. I believe Face Off is the birth of something that wants to explore how far the internet can be used to actually reach the public. Thank you so much. And, and one of the things we need to do actually is to get to the rural communities because the rural communities don't have the kind of information that you and I have and this is what the Rakyat and you and I can actually do. We actually have to take the information out there and one, that's the first thing, is the challenge of actually disseminating getting the information out. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. doing more stuff in Malay, in Mandarin, in Tamil, mm -hmm. where where it, it, it goes out to, to many people. That's one. And second, I Social think, media. is this collective boldness. It's this putting the fear behind us, creating more Rafizi Ramlis, creating more people who, when you, when you smell corruption, when you smell a wrongdoing, you've got to speak out. Getting... Locked up for one time, it could be a death sentence. Could Malaysians be very afraid because of these things yeah. over here and still will not yeah. voice up? I think we've been governed by fear since we were born, you know. And, and we have been governed by fear, but we're slowly taking strides. And that actually is very encouraging. And, and people like us, sometimes my friends and family ask me, why am I doing what am I doing? Because it's so much risk in a country like Malaysia. But it seems like with this kind of collective energy, there's hope, there's hope. And I believe that we're not the Malaysia that we used to be back in the 70s or in the 80s where we were governed by an iron fist. We now are telling our government, put away your iron fist. What we want is democratic space. What we want is a country that's free and where corruption is actually reduced mm -hmm. and that our money, our taxpayers' money is actually managed responsibly. And by that, we'll actually be economically more, more, viable, more mm. well to do in what, the region and what, so on. One of the most corrupted uh, states, I would say, would be uh, the person leading Sarawak. And that's what everyone will say. Uh, do you think there's ever a possibility that Swaram, the human rights, will ever be able to do something? Because obviously, um, one of the richest men in the world would be controlling. Yeah. Well, I have been barred from entering Sarawak and so have many other activists have been barred from entering Sarawak. That's one of his powerful tools of that course. he has used. Yeah. Now there is a video called Global Witness and that has shown how Taib has actually sold land for his own benefit, mm -hmm. for his family's mm -hmm. benefit and so on. Mm -hmm. But um, as long as only people like us know about it, and the rural uh, indigenous peoples and all don't know about it, our battle is only half won. So we have to take it out there. Okay, we need to wrap it up, but let's state very clearly what are our demands here. And this would be an end to police brutality, safer Malaysia. Anything else, Cynthia, which I've left out I th significantly? Yes, I think what do you want the government? Well, in, in, in closing comments, I think it becomes very important now for the police force to revamp their priorities. Look at the crime rate. Look at how that is escalating. Mm. And how people are actually, uh, just because they want to grab a handbag, you lose a life because of that. Now, in Bukit Gassing recently, we've, we've had that uh, incident. And then in Johor Bahru recently, and so on. And it's getting very, very frightening to actually just go anywhere alone. Or even just jogging. Yeah, and yeah. it was never like that before, 10, 15 years ago. So yeah. what are the police doing? Now, I, I, in my other capacity, am also a city councillor in MBPG, mm -hmm. and I can tell you that the police are just finding the easy path by allowing all our public roads to be closed. Now, if you live in PJ or KL, you will see there are many barriers and boom gates yeah. everywhere at night. And those are illegal. Yeah. Those are illegal. Yeah. You can't close public That's the roads. Easy way out. And this is like the Gaza Strip. What are we doing? We're just putting walls all around us. We're mm. not solving 
the crime issue, we're not nabbing the criminals. Mm. So, and one final point that I want to come back to yeah, this sure. case of sure. custodial deaths yes. and in the case of uh, ethnic the Indian rights, mm -hmm. you will find that uh, Watia Murti, the mm -hmm. deputy minister, That's the right. former outlawed That's Hindra right. leader, mm -hmm. had um, formed a pact with the government mm -hmm. where he had left out the human rights elements. Sure. That was the deal. No human rights elements. And custodial deaths are issues of human rights. It's the right to life. It is the most fundamental right. He's become a politician. He's become a politician. But he was saying his focus is on uh, empowerment of Indian youth and you know building entrepreneurship and all that. All that's fine. But when you take out human the elements rights. of human rights and the right to life and you get more custodial deaths like this, and suddenly he's not actually empowered to be able to do anything to change the situation. So is he the right person to be doing the job then? So a lot of question marks. Okay, we'll need to wrap up the show, but of course we'll have some more answers uh, in our next shows to come. And we hope that you out there uh, do follow us on Twitter, Facebook. Like uh, Cynthia said, um, social media is very powerful. And of course, the voice of the people, the voice for truth. I'm Anne Edwards. Thank you so much.